Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to YALSA's webinar, Gamification in Libraries and Teen Tech Week, presented by Joe Murphy. My name is Eve Gauss. I'm the Program Officer for Continuing Education, and I'm going to go ahead and go over a few features of our webinar software before we go ahead and get started. The first thing I'd like to say is a big thanks to our sponsor, Tutor.com, for making this webinar possible today. Um, we really appreciate the support that they're giving to YALSA. We're going to be communicating with each other via chat. Um, so if you have questions or anything, go ahead and feel free to type them in the chat box and Joe will respond. This webinar is going to be moderated by Linda Braun, so um, she will also be watching the chat box and making sure that we get your questions answered. If you don't want to see the chat box during the course of the webinar, you can go ahead and click on the full screen button in the upper right hand side of your screen and that eliminates the chat box and the intended and the attendee list. Um, if you'd like to undo that, just go ahead and click on that button again. On the upper left hand side of the screen, you should see the image of a person with her hand raised. And if you click on the down arrow next to the image of that person, you'll see a whole variety of options, including raising your hand, laughing, applauding, agreeing, disagreeing, etc. So feel free to use those throughout the webinar. And if at any point during the course of the webinar you experience audio issues, please go ahead and type into the chat box and let me know, and I'll work with you to resolve them. Following the presentation today, you will receive a copy of the slides from the PowerPoint, as well as a recording. I'm really pleased to introduce um, our whole panel of presenters today. The first I would like to introduce is Lily Schultz, who is the Marketing Manager at Tutor.com and who's just been great in working with me in making this webinar happen, so we're delighted to have her on today. Next is Linda Braun, who will be moderating the discussion today, and Linda is a past YALSA president and also a past chair of Teen Tech Week. And I would like to introduce our featured speaker of the day, Joe Murphy. Joe Murphy is an independent consultant and speaker on major, current, and upcoming technological trends and how they impact libraries, publishing, and the information and service industries. So at this point, Lily, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you so you can say a few words about Tutor. Sounds good. Thanks, Eve. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Tutor.com provides online, on-demand homework help, tutoring services, and career assistance to millions of students and adults worldwide. Users are connected to a professional tutor online the moment that they need help in math, science, social studies, English, GED prep, and career services. Users can access Tutor.com through a computer or any mobile device at your library or from their homes. And we are the largest online tutoring company with over 2,500 professional background check tutors having delivered over 7.7 .7 million one-to-one -one tutoring sessions. We are excited to be a part of Teen Tech Week and thanks everyone for coming to the webinar. All right, I think that brings me up and I'm Linda Braun and I'm here to uh, moderate as Eve said and I will also um, just say a few words about Teen Tech Week. Some of you are probably very familiar with Teen Tech Week, some of you not so familiar, but I'm so excited um, about this year's theme, Geek Out at Your Library, and just how Teen Tech Week has uh, moved forward over the past few years. I've been thinking a lot about it the past month or so as we've been talking about and hearing about the different privacy um, issues in uh, Congress and, oh, okay, and Eve's just asking me to speak up, so I will do that. Is that better, Eve? So That's I've been thinking a lot, thanks. I've been uh, thinking a lot about this as we've been looking at SOPA, the Online Privacy Acts in Congress, and one of the great things about Teen Tech Week is it celebrates the way that libraries can help teens and their families understand how to use technology uh, safely and uh, figure out the best way to set up their privacy settings on things like Facebook. And so it's just been great to see how we have moved forward over the past uh, several years with Teen Tech Week and the, the importance of helping teens and those that work and live with them to understand uh, all about technology. And gamification, which Joe will be talking about, is a key aspect of this, thinking about how technology can be used in your library with your teens in gaming and in game-like activities in order to help teens understand and better use technology. So Joe, I will now turn it right over to you. 
Great, thank you so much. And actually, in reverse, I would like to say that everything you just mentioned is a really important and integral part of gamification itself. So the circle is complete. We have to make sure that we are leveraging all of the benefits of the things we're learning about in Teen Technology Week, like the ability and the importance of maintaining and controlling our privacy and access, et cetera. These are really core skills that will guide and define our success and the success of our end users throughout this. So Teen Tech Week is a great way and opportunity to really push and leverage all of the radically important skills and aspects of technological engagement, of which gamification can be a fun element. And thank you so much for Tutor.com for sponsoring this. You're great to work with, and I really appreciate the opportunity. And this is actually one of my first times working with YALSA at all. So I know that uh, the young adult librarians that I know are always the best, most exciting, and most current. So I love being able to work with all of you guys. So I actually want to start with an attitudinal slant. The most important thing for us to gain from a conversation about gamification is the importance and a ability to, to leverage the idea of having fun within our activities, not just when we're specifically designing technological services, but also in our approach to services, to workplaces, and to interacting with our end users. So as this picture reminds us, Let's make sure that we're approaching it with the idea of fun and to internalize that fun within ourselves and thus let it be expressed within our workplaces so that ultimately the services we design will in fact have that priority of fun for all of our end users. And as a note, this picture was something I, I came across on Pinterest and I think that the, um, the way that we're starting to engage te technolog technologies such as Pinterest actually are including aspects of gamification itself. And on that same theme, I took a quick screenshot of a search of the term gamification within Pinterest. And this alone shows the really wide array of potential applications and conceptions of gamification. Now, we see it's illustrated in everything from literal technologies here to iconography that demonstrates how to gamify interactions with real life to maps and, of course, to a nice resource about gamification, which I highly recommend which I'll come back to in a second. So as a basic introduction, when we're trying to think about what gamification is, step back and, and read this quote from a famous philosopher that we are never more human than, than when we play. It's the truest expression of our creativity and our interactivity. And this quote here that I took from um, this website, which I hope you can read the, uh, the font size and the citation here, emphasizing that Gamification is simply about integrating game dynamics. Now, it says into your site, service, community, but really into anything. And game dynamics simply mean the ability to turn a real-world situation into having game-like goals and outcomes, whether it's content, campaigns, services, anything at all with the ultimate goal of driving participation, harnessing attention, being able to hold on to and enhance the interactivity and two-way street of attention and drive participation and engagement through it. And as Jane McGonigal says, gaming is fundamentally a part of being human. Now the reason I mentioned Jane's quote here at the bottom is because she is one of the most fabulous authors about this topic and the book which I included on the previous slide was actually by her. Now that article which I linked to there under her quote actually has a uh, um, I would highly recommend it, but it's hard to search for because the author of the interview actually misspells her name. So if you want to hear a little bit more information in depth, check out her starting with this interview. Check out her book, anything she's done. I think last year she was probably the biggest name in gamification, and not just in video games or online interaction, but also with libraries. She's worked very closely with libraries on some fun projects. And this is her book, which I highly recommend, because she talks about not just how to gamify activities, but what the real benefits for education, for people, and for society are within the idea of being able to apply gaming to real life, to solving problems, to developing skills, and to expanding attention-grabbing interactive elements. Now, claiming it's beneficial because it's fun is only the surface. The really important aspects of this is that as much 
current resource has shown, engaging gamification can actually increase and improve and expand several real-world skills that tie directly to library outcomes. For instance, the more experience we have with gaming, the higher our resilience to future challenges becomes, as does simple and complex problem solving and the ability to approach challenges with a positive attitude, all of which, of course, help in education, research, and life. Now, this, again, was a quote from Jane McGonigal. So if you're going to look for more resources, make sure you check out what she has to say. And of course, gamification actually helps us reach a lot of the competencies provided by YALSA itself. I listed here some of the outcomes under Area 2 knowledge of the client group in which I think it directly applies in helping to be familiar with the developmental needs and using the appropriate resources and services with our end user group. We know that gaming is very popular across most demographics of young adults. And we know that we can help reach them, help improve their interaction with libraries, and help improve their interaction with content if we're able to leverage the technologies that are important to them and that work with them within their developmental stages. And also, of course, the aim here is to keep up to date with the pop culture of gaming and the trend and relevancy of gamification and the related technological advances within this and also as they apply a little wider to all of technological interaction with young adults. Another area I thought it was obvious that there was a pretty strong application for YALSA competency was part three of area three in communication, marketing, and outreach. Now it's, uh, it's easy to simply use these services for marketing, but also by engaging gamification with the library, you're demonstrating that the library has the ability to provide services in a meaningful and successful manner, creating thus a stronger community. And also, it's a great way to promote the services to young adults directly and, of course, and user parents. And now, I actually found that there are so many competency areas that this related to that I'm not going to list them all here, but I have a few more I'd like to talk about now and at the end. Something I thought was really interesting was almost every area of competency seven really directly apply to this. And the reason we should be concerning how this impacts the YALSA competencies is because if we are able to understand and leverage gamification with our services, we know that we're directly working towards consistently improving and keeping up a high quality of service for our end user groups as provided via YALSA. And one of those areas within seven, being able to design, implement, and evaluate programs and services within the framework of our strategic plan being able to, whenever possible, represent the library and the young adult's involvement. Now, of course, we know that this directly impacts marketing and PR, but it also impacts the direct ability to appeal to our end users and attract them. And through gamification, we can identify and plan services that aren't necessarily traditional or in traditional settings, and that can help to facilitate those ongoing levels of engagement and, of course, to meet a variety of recreational as well as informational services to continually identify the trends within this technology suite, within this interaction suite, and beyond, and to help directly instruct a young adult end users in each of the aspects that make them effective and efficient information users, how to research, gather, and evaluate information, and how to use that to problem solve and meet end goals. And through this, we can actively involve young adults, part six of that competency, to plan and implement and refine services and programs that are flexible for the future. Now, there's actually quite a bit of stereotypes that a, a few statistics can help us dispel about gamification. It turns out in a pew in a recent study that it's not as male-centered or as child-centered as we would expect. In fact, the, um, the average social gamer is a woman in, in her early 40s. Now, the reason that this is important for us now in the context of working with young adults 
is that oftentimes the people that we want to be able to reach with our marketing of these programs isn't just the end users who will benefit from them, but the stakeholders who will then help support libraries seeing how we are making sure we're relevant to those concerned individuals. And the amount of time that people are spending on gaming is drastically increasing. About two-thirds of people play an online social game at least once a day. And 95% of social gamers themselves play multiple times a week. So this is an area that is widespread and demonstrates deep involvement. But of course, young adults themselves are significant gamers. In fact, a quarter of all gamers are, in fact, under 18. And about a fifth of social gamers are teens themselves. They are different types of gaming interaction. But so even though the average age is no longer a child, they still represent an adequate demarcation of that demographic. So the really important thing here is we, everyone knows that applying gamification and more importantly, or more obviously, I guess, engaging gaming, and so whether it's social gaming, mobile gaming, or traditional video gaming, is a great way to reach those young adults. Being able to leverage these actually helps us to continue to stay in track with our growing patrons. So make sure that we reach them now, so as they change, they understand the value and can demonstrate that of the library. One area that's been really big, social gaming, has shown absolutely impressive statistics over the last couple of years. One in five Americans, actually over the age of six, has reportedly played at least one social online game, and that about a tenth of them have spent money within those games, which have created entire industries within them, showing over $2 billion in revenue over the last year, and that's projected to grow over the next year. More than a third of social gamers actually are not traditional gamers, as in they have no previous gaming experience. They don't come from the world of video games. They've simply begun to engage social gaming online, whether it's through Facebook or through mporgs or whatever it may be. They're coming directly to this, so we know that we don't have to just consider the traditional video gamer network. And of course, Facebook continues to dominate the world of social gaming. And these statistics are a really interesting way to illustrate that. I found this infographic to be actually a bit stunning, not only because that Zynga specifically, with its multiple popular games, has over 60 million active users every day and 230 million monthly users, but also that they report having 38,000 virtual items created within their games every second. So it's not just people playing these games at a high level and at a repetitive rate, but actually engaging within information and items within them for a creative process. So they're not just wasting time on there. They're engaging each other. They're engaging the game. They're fulfilling the qualifications and meeting goals. Of course, it's radically impressive also that within social games of Zynga's multiple platforms, there are actually over 4 billion connections. They actually listed as neighbor connections. So that's people who have elected to interact with each other. And this all adds up to over 2 billion minutes of games played every day just by Zynga. So we know that it's no small fish. Now, a few more number of statistics here to think about. In the area of social gaming, we see that it's actually projected to make about $6 billion next year. So more than tripling from last year. And the reason this is important to us is not only because of the power this industry is starting to have and the ability for us to be able to become a part of that, but also that amount of money is attracting a lot of vendors to include gamifications in their resources and projects. So ultimately, it's filtering down to libraries anyways. So whether or not we provide gamification in our services, we're going to have to start interacting with providing resources and services that already have gamification elements in them. So we need to make sure that we are ahead of the curve in being able to meet exactly those goals, being familiar with them, understanding what it means for end users, understanding how to engage it as people, as library consumers, and as library professionals, so that when we do develop services, when we do market platforms, we know exactly what it will mean for the end user and know how to strategically apply those. And then there's an area a little bit more closer to my heart 
just because I recently wrote a book about location-aware social networks. But something I thought was really interesting was the huge growth of Foursquare in the last couple of years introduced an element of gaming to your interaction with physical places, including libraries. The reason I thought this is really interesting is because it brought the idea of location-based gaming into an actionable world that provided lots of service opportunities for all sorts of businesses, libraries, publishers, anything that has a place relevance. And that place relevance doesn't have to do necessarily with what we have to offer, but with the place being an element in our patrons' own interaction. And there's a lot of ways to think about this. Now, if you're not familiar with Foursquare, it's still really big, it's still growing, and it's still a major player, even though it's been around for a couple of years. It's the way to check in and, game, and gain in-game points and badges, etc., for being able to engage a physical location. So you're being rewarded for playing a game, and that game is between you, your mobile phone, your social network, and that physical location. And some of the ways that we could use this would be to actually simply plug ourselves in as libraries, as physical places, into that interactive level of our patrons. Now, Foursquare is a tool that's actually expanding into most of our demographics. So that is perfectly a perfectly viable opportunity for engaging gamification within our communities. Now, the, there are easy and cheap ways to do this. All, the first step is actually what I think I would recommend for everything with gamification, is simply opening up your attitude and policies to allowing for a way that your patrons can naturally engage your services, your locations, and your content in a way that's fun for them. So simply allowing it. Now, with Foursquare, this is easy. Because all you have to do is not restrict their usage. But of course, that's a little easier said than done, and we have complex policies in our workplaces that may trend towards controlling the engagement of devices instead of freeing them up. And of course, when we're working with young adults, those considerations can be a, a high priority. So finding a balance can be difficult but important. So the first step for applying gamification through location-based services in our libraries is to allow our patrons utilizing cell phones to do that within our library spaces. The next step is actually facilitating it. So not just disal not just not disallowing it, but making sure it's f fulfilling and easy for those end users. You can also f directly engage in the game yourself, providing opportunities and rewards for your library visitors to check into your library and gain those rewards, whether they're direct through the game or through specials, etc. And of course, there are other players out there, too. It's not just the in-game rewards, the, the badges and points that matter, but the actual ability to interact with it that is the real reward. So using Facebook's location-engaged services is a great way to do that as well. And the entire larger concept of mobile gaming, focusing on the mobile devices as the platform for gaming, is really the largest trend within this. And the way that we can best leverage this is to facilitate the existing usage of handheld gaming by our patrons, to directly engage in that by providing games and the devices, as some libraries are doing, to join in and be either a partner or a facilitator with that, or to be able to simply foster that community, to facilitate the connections between those gaming partners or between the gamers and the educational elements, most importantly, of course, with the goal of providing opportunities. And the reason this is so important is because that nowadays access to smartphone is much less limited than it used to be. I saw a recent statistic showing that 77% of households or something allow their children to use their tablet devices. And even though smartphone access is biggest among the 25 to 34 range, we see here that it's quite popular and growing very quickly in the age range of 13 to 17. So we know that access to mobile gaming through smartphone devices, not just things like handheld gaming elements, are actually quite popular amongst our end user groups. And just one more note about statistics with this. I thought it was really interesting on the top right seeing that 84% of tablet owners use that tablet to play games. And of course, that 70 to 80% of the downloaded applications are, in fact, gaming applications. And in the bottom, we, we see that the huge growth of Angry Birds itself is absolutely staggering and continues to, to be. 
but it's not just Angry Birds and, and uh, Farmville. Words with Friends has been fabulously popular this year. And it's even elicited some comical drama on the, uh, on the celebrity stage when Alec Baldwin got uh, kicked off a plane because he refused to stop playing Words with Friends on a smartphone. It, it can be that addictive and that fun that people can risk such trouble for it. And then levels of engagement are absolutely astounding. So thinking about if this many people are using their mobile devices to play a game based on being having word knowledge and cleverly apply that, that terminology, it's a great thing that we can think about to facilitate within our own libraries. You can actually leverage this. You can harness this by providing this educational opportunity. What I'd actually like to do for a couple minutes now is stop just talking at you and have a short couple minute discussion with my co-host, Linda, about gamification in libraries. And then when we come back, we'll talk about some other specific applications, if that sounds good. That sounds great. So <laughs> if anyone has a question, now would be a fabulous time to, to do it. Otherwise, we can lead a short discussion. You know, Joe, I have, I'm going to ask a first question while maybe some people will type in questions. And one of the things that really strikes me, or my head, my brain explodes a lot. You're making, and it's a good thing. I have brain explosions in a positive way. Um, and one of the things you're making me think, you know, hearing about Words with Friends and Foursquare and um, some of the other things you've noted is that we all have to change our concept of what we mean by gaming. Because Foursquare, I don't, I don't know if everyone thinks of as gaming and gamification worthy. Uh, so could you talk about that a little bit, about just sort of how broad this is? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it turns out that gaming or gamifying our traditional activities is actually the true trend at root here. So you, Foursquare doesn't market itself as a game. It doesn't even, and most people don't think of it as a game. But the reason it is is because it applies, again, those gaming elements, the, the uh, ability to interact with the idea of driving to rewards for real world goals. That's gaming at its, at its best definition. Small accomplishments that, that, uh, that drive towards wins in learning and, and act interactivity. So you think about that same thing in other venues as well. A lot of our interaction with online social networks can be thought of as gaming because we're not only doing it for the idea of sharing, but for the rewards. Rewards built rewards built into increasing and expanding our social network as well as working towards the goals of collaborate as in collaborative efforts. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because if we start to think about what we do in libraries and the services we provide to teens, we may see opportunities for gamification that we may, might never have thought of otherwise. Um, and you mentioned Pinterest, and I definitely think um, broadening my view right now, uh, that comes into play for sure. Now I see Steve, Steven has asked a question. Uh, do typical mobile games have sound? And I guess gamers use earphone, earphones. I, I really like this question. <laughs> this, this is because it taps into a couple important things here, and that's that even if we're forced to allow mobile devices into our libraries, it doesn't mean that we have to sacrifice the quiet or the silence that we also need to value. And he's right also to say that many gamers will have earphones, but not all. And so the policy then has to shift away from outlawing devices or behavior towards guiding through of priorities of, uh, of interpersonal considerations. So take down our sign saying, no, no mobile gaming and no smartphones. Replace them with, please remember to turn your volume down or have your earphones in. Right. It's all about the behavior and how it um, has an impact on the others in the library and not necessarily the activity, um, which I think is an interesting way of looking at. Does anybody else have another question uh, for Joe before we move on? None? All right, that's, uh, that's sure. great. We'll come back for another question section in, uh, in about 10 or so minutes. So if you do have any questions, think about them and jot them down, and we'll uh, have plenty of time for you soon. So in sticking with the Words with Friends model, we can think about some of the areas for opportunities and steps in leveraging the trend of gamification. We, the entire benefit that we should be thinking about in the largest scale is that gamification allows us to more broadly attract and hold attention with the idea that we can 
have a tool at hand, an innate human nature tool of being able to gather that attention and to hold it within something that is beneficial for our end users, but that they don't necessarily have the motivational drive to engage. So it holds their attention while also harnessing their engagement. It's not simply keeping them looking with something flashy. It's giving them an activity to drive them towards an end goal that's beneficial for the strategic goal that uh, libraries are trying to provide for our end users. So ways to be able to give them the opportunities, the skills, the content, et cetera, in a way that harnesses their natural engagement. And you can do all of this with the simple goals of just introducing the library through orientations. You can do it to teach skills, whether it's direct use of resources or more generally learning research skills, et cetera. Or you can just use it to provide a new interesting level of traditional services. The whole point, though, is that it has to be interactive and engaging, and it can also simply improve the way that you're able to interact within your library, within the, between the patrons and, and yourselves, and the patrons and content, and the patrons and themselves. So then, simply using the idea, the concept of providing gaming elements to enhance everything that the library does. What gamification really means is turning the real world into a game with its own goals of whether it's learning or fun by having small steps that drive towards that. And one of my favorite examples of gamification in libraries was the recent New York Public Library experiment where they actually ran a game again developed by Jane McGonigal called Find the Future. And what they did is they hosted a, a night-long event at the main building of the New York Public Library which was interactive and creating an experience to actually tie into their centennial. So it was already tied into an ex existing program. And what, it, what they did is they hosted an adventure-themed game, which was tied also into an online version of the game called Find the Future. And it combines real-world missions with virtual clues within the library. So it gamifies the ability to find items within a library. And they did this with some really interesting ways, but actually was inspired by over 100 works within the collections library that they wanted people to make sure that they were aware of and to engage directly. And for in-depth information, they have a great website on the New York Public Library for this, I think, under exhibits. But some, some of the details that I thought were interesting was the, uh, the developer of this, McGonagall, said that the game was designed to empower the young people to find their own futures then doing this by bringing them face to face with the objects in the library, the writings and objects of people who made an extraordinary difference. And it, this happened last May, I believe, and it also was tied into a Write All Night event. And so the people who, who, in, who participated explored the building using their mobile devices and following clues. So these clues led them to be able to engage different items and then not just find them, but actually engage the educational element of them. So after you found each object, which included things like a copy of the Declaration of Independence, every player would write a short essay inspired by the quest. So they would also, they would, for instance, write, sorry, had a small audio issue here. So, um, and at the end, what they would do is they would take these, all these writings and kind of create a collaborative book about it. About it. So you had then a, a, a piece, an, a, an educational item developed by being able to interact with the contents of the library that then was able to help other people. Really interesting ways to tie it in together. So look at this as the best example, at least the most exciting, most current. It tied in each of the major elements and was fabulously successful. This was a screenshot of their, of the web page of it, and they did a great job of including the online element too. And there's a really nice introductory video here if you want to watch the trailer for a, a bit more of a spiel. And they showed here that to play, you only needed the app because it was mobile driven, yourself at the library, and the artifacts and writing that you've done from it. And then another library example that was really untraditional, actually, that impressed me was a, uh, a local library I visited, the Fayetteville Free Library, 
created a space, an innovation space called the Fab Lab. And the whole goal of this was to give people an opportunity to interact with new technology and create their own things. It includes things like this 3D printer. And this was a picture I took there and then posted to Instagram. And this 3D printer, any patron could design an object that they wanted it to build and then actually have it built at the library. So they're able to then have fun with the technology in a way that gives them a, an expression, a self-reward of artistic creation. It could even be a very practical creation. And brought them through the steps of learning the technologies with their own goal in mind. And all that the library had to do was provide the space for this. So this is a great way to think about bringing gamification into your own library. To think about not just how we can create games ourselves, but how we can make our patrons or empower our patrons to use gamification, to use interactivity and technology to drive their own goals. I thought this was a very powerful example of this, and it'd be really fun to hear more about what they're doing. And then there's actually a lot already going on or that we can talk about in traditional services. Library orientation tends to be the most popular sphere for this. Sorry, I just had to take a sip of my tea. One way that this is really easy is through scavenger hunts, kind of just simple ways to give people fun opportunities to learn the library with step-by-step -step goals that lead to the ultimate goal of learning the library itself so that you're able to use it successfully for yourself. Now, keep in mind that gaming is possible without large financial investments. Things like scavenger hunts aren't going to cause you uh, a budget problem. You just have to think about what it really means for the service side of it and the staff side of it to make sure that it's easy, as quickest, and cheapest for the library patrons. And of course, you can make learning online resources just as fun as learning library resources based in print or the physical library. And of course, the best way to learn is to play. So kind of taking the, the linear narrative out of our, a lot of our instruction and teaching and opening it up to an interactive, engagement, playable story. And this has traditionally been through locating resources, but it can also be through sharing and engaging what you find as a New York Public Libraries project does, or learning specific skills like citations or talking about authors or even just basic literacy. And I do feel that you can also gamify services. Reference doesn't have to be without that element of fun. And any point of communication can actually have reward base in it so that you can drive further the quality of that content of communication. And I actually think that there's lots of opportunity to gamify our interaction with content itself by adding gaming elements to the discovery process to self-curation, like with Pinterest. So if you make it fun and rewarding to be able to discover content of relevance to the patrons and give them a way to interact and share with it, like Pinterest does, in a way that can be rewarding on a social sphere, then you've all of a sudden entered gaming qualities within into their discovery process. And then there's things like interactive eBooks, which simply by putting yourself or your patrons or uh, any community group into the books themselves, they all of a sudden have a fun, reward-based motivation for engaging that content. And one of the easiest ways to do almost all of those things is with QR codes. QR codes are their small, two-dimensional, scannable barcodes that you can read with your smartphones. And they're extremely cheap. The process itself is free. It only costs anything in staff time. And you can use these directly for scavenger hunts, which has been done by a lot of libraries and, um, and wider events. But you can also use it to make it fun to connect with content or with services, or for people to be able to not just scan and get a link, but interact with the content at that link. So you're providing access, but also the ability to interact and share wider. It also puts, in a really easy and cheap manner, your mobile users into that gaming layer for your library and to actually make mobile their experience in the library. But most importantly, you're taking the static walls or shelves of your library and turning them into an interactive experiment that the people themselves can have with their library experience. I also found this picture on Pinterest, and it made me think that we can turn the question of 
did you learn anything at the library to did you have fun and actually have those be the same thing in the end so that when our patrons leave they can say wow I really had fun at the library and we know that if they had fun they met the goal of our gaming elements and we can look at wider examples across many industries about how to do this but the real important thing for us to keep in mind is that we can make small accomplishments that drive towards learning at the library easy and fun and so what I want to express next is to not just gamify and how you think about your library services but in your own professional learning experiences so as we enter teen tech week gamify your experience there make sure to take advantage of everything they have to offer and think about the real rewards make it really fun and there's lots of easy ways to do this but this can also tie directly back again into those YALSA competencies we know that if we're engaging with the great resources we're learning about at Teen Tech Week then we have an opportunity to further our ability as professionals to make sure we have fluid dynamic and future ready services and content in our libraries and to do it within a community it's already perfectly set up for that fun gaming learning experience and something else I want to stress is that using gaming elements is a great way to advocate for not just the library itself and its flexibilities but for the ability to to market the library's relevancy within a changing environment now we know that uh, that simply engaging technologies does itself show that we're able to be future ready and and uh, flexible but if we can then make that fun and make the ability of our community members to continue to be future ready and have access to the changes that are affecting their lives then we know that we're fulfilling our our need most preciously to be able to help them succeed as things change as well so make sure that we keep in mind throughout our professional learning process throughout our interaction with each other and how we think about our approaches to library services that we stay inspired and keep inspiration as the key that we have the idea of libraries being fun not just bright colors and good times but the activities of engaging what the library offers is a fun experience as well as our approach to offering professional services is fun and we can make sure that this is a really exciting time to leverage this suite of technologies across our really fun and uh, important suite of services so let's make sure to have fun today and every day and I think we'll now open it up to questions again right um, thanks Joe I'm just let's have fun today I'm get, is that a t-shirt I would love that as a t-shirt um, so yeah if people have questions and I was also gonna going to ask that if you have ideas so you don't have to just type in questions if you have an idea from what Joe said um, something you might do uh, during Teen Tech Week or after Teen Tech Week that would be great as well and I know that Linda is typing and while she's typing I have I'll start off with a, a question and it goes back to something that I'm always um, thinking about and wondering about and that is um, how I know many teen librarians who are uh, very interested in bringing gaming and gamification into their libraries but they struggle with making the sell to administrators or colleagues and you said earlier Joe that the first thing you should do is to have an open mind how do you help others to have that open mind does that make that sense? really is a yeah that's a great point and it's a key <laughs> consideration and yeah. it's not always just as fun as saying no don't worry this will be beneficial but turning again their interaction and their priorities into uh, the same language of gaming elements and then you can turn around and have that feedback down the pike but being able to sell gaming think about more widely how it answers strategic uh, goals of the library itself so look at your strategic plan and find out where increasing gaming elements within your services would help meet those and keep that as a priority when you're making those arguments because anything the administrator ha is going to do it has to be in line with those long-term goals and also when you're creating those long-term goals make sure that you have gaming elements set in place for meeting those itself because gamification isn't just a technology trend it's a really successful and immediate way to meet your goals 
Great. Uh, thank you. And I think that, you know, always bringing it back to the goal and what you can do for the community is huge. Now, Linda asked um, about leaving out a portion of the population uh, who don't have cell phones uh, for library games with QR codes. And she says she doesn't have a cell phone and um, serves a low-income area. Uh, thoughts about that, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Now, we talked a lot about cell phone and, and smartphone examples of this, but really the applications are the same if you're going to use analog projects as well. It's, it's really the goal of being able to drive drive engagement for specific goals that are that have real world benefits. It doesn't have to be technology based. It, it can be actually a way to learn about technology, but it doesn't have to be all through the mobile device itself. There are a lot of libraries that are offering not just video games, but board games, etc. Being able to simply gamify your interaction with patrons, so whatever is appropriate for your end user group as far as what they have access to and be able to close your local digital divides or be able to skirt the issue itself, the gaming elements are not, in fact, technologically, um, they're not only limited to our technology plans. But they really should be all with the same goal of education or meeting our goals of of providing these quality services, and it's OK that those can be, even though this is Teen Tech Week, it's OK that those can be towards learning whatever is appropriate. That appropriate level of technology can simply be analog interaction, for sure. That's uh, definitely a good way to look at it. And I have a question. I know several people are typing, but I'm wondering um, if we could have people uh, raise their hand, and Eve mentioned at the very beginning of this that there was a hand raising tool. So up in the top uh, left, you should see a hand. If you raise your hand, if you are a gamer, so do you um, play games of any kind from Foursquare to uh, 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 I, RuneScape to whatever? They've all gone out of my head. But uh, raise your hand if you are a gamer, and we'll get a count of those. Um, and while people are raising their hand, uh, right, Leslie says uh, they play board games in their library. And Erin is um, thinking about gamification for her summer reading program. Can you expand on that, Erin? Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're thinking? And then um, Annette says, what gaming tools do we recommend? Do you recommend for quick game interaction besides QR codes? What about that, Joe? We got a couple really good questions there okay. for for quick ways to interact besides QR codes. Now, QR codes are good, and the reason we mention them is because their ability to provide interaction. But you can transfer that that same level of engagement to other things. Your 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 goals for driving interaction, for instance, with your library's Facebook page could have gaming elements as well that provide rewards for them and drive the goals of meeting their interactivity with the library too. So think about applying those, those ideas, that interactivity, to almost any application. And there you go. It doesn't have to be about QR codes. Then, and each of those can be rather cheap or free. And I'm trying to remember, I think there is a, a, a software program you can even put on a computer with a, that has a webcam so you can scan um, QR codes if you wanted to do something uh, using just using a webcam on a traditional library computer. So that might also be a way to give teens the experience with QR codes if they can't use uh, their own or others' devices. Um, let's see, what are other people saying? Um, scavenger hunts, board games, looking for something new since participation is falling off. Um, and uh, Linda, but you are looking for something that is non-tech non based. Do I have that right? That's true, Aaron. about um, reading a certain amount of books. It is like unliking achievement. And just to uh, yeah. do a little buzz, and that Joe, go ahead, just do a little press for Yalsa. Uh, Yalsa is working on a badges project that they're presenting um, tomorrow at the Digital Media and Learning Conference. So hopefully Yalsa will have something in that way, too. So Joe, what were you going to say about unlocking badges and reading? Or I was going to say that that's a brilliant idea. It, 
what so many of these resources do is, is reward you with something as simple as a badge for your online engagement with something you're already doing in the real world, like reading. So your library can simply hand out a badge. That'd be great. It doesn't have to be a badge. It can be a reward. It can be a gift. Or it can be the physical representation of an online badge and to, to, to keep that theme. So that's a great way to skirt the technology, but to keep the same goal. And you know, thinking about Pinterest, I mean, if the library has computers where teens can log into Pinterest at the library, they can um, have a collaborative Pinterest board where everyone's putting up the books that they read and talking about them, and you can still see who's reading what books and how many books different um, kids are reading. So that also is just adding to that can be a really good way to get that involvement and energy going. Stump the librarian. How'd you do it, Amanda? Oh, and I know a library that did a physics program where they did do an Angry Birds for real. <laughs> um, so that the, uh, I think it was tweens actually, tweens made catapults and did all these different kinds of things uh, so they could play Angry Birds on the, at the library uh, without the devices. That's brilliant. That's great because you can really learn math and geometry and physics from a game like Angry Birds and you don't necessarily have to be doing it within the virtual environment. In fact, Angry Birds is selling a lot of educational books because of that and so why not replicate it at your library? That's great. It is great. Um, and everybody wants this list that, uh, is, I missed what the list is, but that's a great idea. Um, so there's lots of really great ideas, and I think that for Teen Tech Week, these are um, going to keep us going and um, for longer than that. So, and Amanda, you had your form and come up with a, you had 15 minutes? Wow. Um, that's pretty amazing. Joe, I had another question, um, and that is about crowdsourcing. Is crowdsourcing, would you consider that a gamifying activity? It absolutely can be, because the reward built in would be that your community has the ability to contribute to whatever project you're crowdsourcing. And that could be just feedback, or it could be the creation of content, or a local publica publication, or an exhibit. So yeah, you can, you can gamify any one of those things and more by bringing the community in and having either just that engagement be the reward or something else directly. You can crowdsource art in your library. You could crowdsource the feedback for the next book to read, etc. So yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, because um, one of the really big things in teen services, uh, rightly so, is youth participation and getting teens involved. So I think just thinking about how you can have teens um, help you build programs and be engaged in, in a particular goal um, leads to that same gamifying, gamification principle. Um, did we miss any questions? Are there any other questions? Definitely keep going with the different ideas, but are there other questions? Because as people who know me know, I can just continue to ask questions for hours. Um, so I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that everybody else gets a chance to ask. Okay, so um, I will ask another question then, uh, just to um, keep it going while people are typing. And I guess my my other next question is um, things like libraries um, integrating both. Um, I'm I'm going to go back to the technology part, but having. Um, devices that the library helps uh, teens to have. So either any experience you have that with Joe or anyone in the chat, because as um, Linda said earlier, she's not in a community where people have their own devices. Are, are there ways Joe or anyone else has ideas of how you can help uh, teens try out the devices? Because one of the other things that Teen Tech Week does is to help teens um, gain skills, and so having these devices on hand is really useful. So has anybody had any experience with that? Or Joe, have you seen people, um, libraries, handing out devices for these kinds of things? 
Yeah, actually, and it, and it is a great way to learn about it. Some of them will hand out the devices, some of them will have open houses so they can play with them themselves or be able to check them out or even just come to the library to use, whether it's touch screens or 3D printers or uh, those Expresso print-on-demand machines. So any way that they're able to use them to directly learn about them in, in a way that's useful to, to their end goals is great. And some of those that were mentioned were really good ideas. You, you can have um, special events or just have them available at your circulation or reference desk to play with so that they're able to get their hands on and learn in a real playful environment. Yeah, and Erin just said she's about to have an e-reader petting zoo um, for alongside a retro gaming program. So Erin, I want you to tell us more about that uh, too. Um, and I guess actually Anne-Marie brings up an interesting point about a Mario Kart gaming program. And how do, um, Joe, how do you suggest people stay up on trends and just um, making sure that they're um, continuing? Angry Birds is huge right now. Uh, Words with Friends is very big. But do you have suggestions on how people can stay up on gaming and gamification so that they're, um, they're getting the teens involved and um, impassioned as well? Well, the best thing we have going for us is this community around Teen Tech Week right here. So use your personal community, your professional community, as your personal learning network. So stay in touch with everyone else who's involved with the Teen Tech Week. See what they're doing. Follow their Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds. And seeing what their thoughts are is almost more important than staying current with the technology. Or you can simply watch what's going on in the gaming industry or the technologi technological industry and see how that might filter down to fund service opportunities that for you yourself. Anyone else have ideas for staying current with gaming and tech? Yeah, um, Twitter is it for me. Um, I That's how I find everything I know in the world is on Twitter. Um, but I think that, you know, keeping up with each other is a great idea. And if you haven't um, see, been using the Teen Tech Week Ning, that's a really great resource. And I just also wanted to mention that last week, and um, Sarah Ludwig, who is the chair of this year's Teen Tech Week committee, started a Teen Tech Week Pinterest board. And if anybody wants to add that, some of the things you, you guys are talking about here related to the activities you're planning or ideas you have, um, getting uh, photos and images and comments and discussion about what you're planning there is a great way, great thing to do, too. Um, Anybody have uh, ways that they keep up with the tech, with the what's going on with gaming and gamification? Yeah, things do take time to uh, 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 catch on. And thank you, Eve, for that um, that link. I find that, and maybe Joe, you have some advice on this. I find that figuring out how to collaborate on Pinterest is one of the most difficult things. It took me a little while to get how to do that, how to follow someone and then follow you. Uh, but so if you go to that, you'll want to follow that board, um, and then Sarah can get you hooked in. She has info on that. Have you found that, Joe? Do you have any tips for Pinterest use? Well, my, my biggest tip may be actually that I'm teaching a couple workshops coming up about Pinterest. You didn't and even we can... talk about that. I didn't feed you that. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so there might be some good opportunities to, uh, uh, to learn all the details. There's, there's one coming up with, um, that, I, that uh, Learning Times is producing for me. And I can, I'll put a URL in the chat thing in a second once I remember it. Great. Um, oh, and yeah, Y Pulse and 4YA, the Yelsa blog is also, um, I can't have to put in a pitch for that, is also good. Are there any, we're just about running out of time, are there any final questions for people, for Joe? About gamification and gaming and teen services? I guess the one other thing that I've been thinking about is um, how to also connect this with the STEM movement, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which is a very uh, powerful way to connect with schools and libraries and teens. And uh, since gaming, some gaming has to do with technology, but uh, science, technology, engineering, and math is all about, there's a lot related to problem solving and troubleshooting. So I think that's another way to think about this and connecting to teens is through that STEM approach. All right. Well, Joe, any final words? 
No, I don't think so, but I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I felt like I've actually learned a lot from this. So thanks so much for this opportunity. That's a real a learner is somebody who's always learning even when they're presenting. Um, I want to <laughs> thank everybody for coming. And Eve, do you have any final uh, Yalta comments? Hi. Uh, just to say thank you so much to Joe, Linda, and Lily, and everyone for um, coming together to put this webinar today webinar on today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and again, a reminder, you will be getting the slides, the PowerPoint, the recording, and that uh, book list that Annette just sent me. So thanks, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. It was wonderful to see you all on today. And I just want to say have a great Teen Tech Week, and I'll be looking for you on the Pinterest and the Ning and all the other great things. And he also has, I'll just say, because we have 30 seconds, uh, two tweet-ups coming as a part of Teen Tech Week, one about STEM that is uh, next week on March 7th, and then a couple of days later, one on the Hunger Games, just in time for the movie. So hope to see some of you there as well. Thanks, everyone.